The Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 14. Again, the verse. Christian man. If you've been in Christ all that time, 
and you can't get over your itch. If you've been in Christ all of that time, and you you can't deal with your brother or your sister in a better manner than what you feel. Well, what about that 16-year-old Christian? What about that 21-year-old Christian? And so then we're supposed to be, somebody said this morning, the light of the world. And when folks look at us, and especially young believers, they are to learn lesson from us, learn lesson pertaining to human relationships, how to handle different situations, how to conduct ourselves in the midst of the storm that come into our life. And so then he knew that the problem was not spiritual. And he knew that that aim was outside of the will of God. And so that's why I need to get my little church, my young church, out of, again, that atmosphere, out of that environment. And so then, my question to you is, have you checked your motive lately? Can you say that what I am doing is truly and only for the glory of God? and for the advancement of his kingdom. It makes no difference whether you're pastor, whether you uh, teaching. It makes no difference. The question is, can you speak that your motive is pure and true? And I'm doing it not for a paycheck. I'm doing it not for the glory of man. But I'm doing it for the glory of of God. See, when you do it for the glory of God, you're able to look beyond uh, the obstacles, look beyond the weapon that Satan fires at you, and look beyond the, the trap that he tried to set for you, and look beyond the innuendo and the suggestions that you might make to your mind. You look beyond that because I'm, I'm doing this for the glory of God, and I don't expect it to be easy all the time, because after all, he did tell me, when he put me on this journey, when he involved me in this ministry, or whatever it is, he told me that the servant is no greater than a man. If they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. He told me, if I had trials and tribulations, you're going to have trials and tribulations as well. And so then when well, Satan comes against you, when storms of time rise in your life, you're not looking to blame others. You are asking yourself, what purpose does God have in allowing this situation to exist in my life? Somebody needs to hear that today because this, this situation that you're in can tell you now. The situation that you're in has upset you much. You need to understand this, that God is still in control. Nothing will be taking place in your life, whether it's good or bad, except God has permitted it or caused it to be so. You need to cheer up. You need to cheer up. That's where you can stop. You can, you can stop blaming one another in the home. You can, you can stop blaming your boss on the job. You can stop blaming your co-workers because God knows exactly. And I'll show you that later. God knows exactly what you need and knows what I need. And God is still working all things out for the good of those who love Him. God can take your limit, and He can make limit. God can, God, God can take the hurt and the pain that you experience in your life and turn it into a learning experience, make you strong, so that you can have a Bible testimony, a Bible testimony as to what God can do. You can tell others who are struggling, I've been there. Matter of fact, I was lower than what you are. I was deeper than what you are. But the Lord brought me out. I'm not telling you what David said. I'm not telling you what Michael said. I'm telling you what I experienced for myself. I call upon the name of the Lord. You can tell them that. I call upon the name. And God made a way for me out of nowhere. God brought me out. He brought me up. He set my foot upon a rock. Yeah. So then Jesus said, the young church is not able to bear this temptation too great. A temptation, Dr. Joe Gregory, wrote a book, too great a temptation. 
reflected on which Trogo and uh, first Baptist Church of Dallas, and the first uh, Christ were dying of a too great temptation. And Jesus knew that this was too great a temptation for his disciples. Yes. Yes. And so therefore, he would say, go on the other side. Yes. You're not able to have this. Yes. You're not able to have what is taking place on this side. So you have to go on this side. Somebody ought to help me out this way. You need to know that the side that you're on right now may not be the final destiny that God has for you, but this might be the side of preparation. God might have you on this side because he's prepared. And once he gets you prepared, once he enlightens your mind, once he gets you to understand that, that what you can't get along without him, once you learn the lesson, that is on this side, then he'll bring you back to this side. And the thing that you can't have now because you're too weak, you'll be able to have them later because you'll learn some lessons on this side from my computer. You'll learn some lessons on this side. And so the few down is going to be the side of preparation. If the fuel being ridiculed and gone is not appreciated, it might be the side of preparation. God want to make you strong over here. But if you leave your stay here, this situation over here is too much. And it just might destroy you. that make sense? It just might destroy you. But I'm going to bring you over here and I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to put on you the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to put the shield of faith in your hand. Put your, your feet shot. Doctor of the preparation of peace. Yeah. Now when I send you back to this side, you'll be able to have yeah. Glory, hallelujah. That's what he had. Have you checked your motive lately? While on the sea, a stone arose. And then let me tell you this. But but brethren, they, 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 they were with Jesus. Yes, yeah, a stone arose. Brethren, they had seen his miracles. A stone arose. The kind of Get you to see that no matter what you know, no matter who you are, no matter what you have, no matter what your friends say about you, you need to know that storm will rise. Everybody don't think that you're the best singer in the world. Everybody, everybody don't think that you're the best preacher in the world. Everybody won't think that you're the best teacher in the world. Everybody won't think that way about you. Whether it's true or not, everybody won't think. Everybody won't jump on the bandwagon with you. I'm, I'm helping somebody. I know I'm helping somebody. So you get all upset with those people on your job or with uh, your circle of friends. You find out that one of them is acting up. And you get all but you need to understand, my brother and my sister, Jesus did not have a hundred percent. What makes you think you're going to have a hundred percent? If storm will come in your life, storm will come no matter your economic condition, no matter your financial status, storm will come no matter your ed education or accomplishment, storm will come. You're going to find that you. Sometimes you're the only one that's shouting over your bachelor's degree. <laughs> you're the only one that's waving your master's degree. You're the only one that, 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 that promotes your doctor's degree. You're going to find out a whole lot of folks don't care about that. They just don't like you and they won't like you and they won't go along with you. Stone will come in your life. You're not going to understand that. You need to make sure. When storm come, that your faith is anchored in Jesus. Because storms are bound to come. At some time or another in your life, storms will come in your life. You say, at some time of that future, but presently, I'm already in the storm. That's why I can only tell you how to handle yourself when you find yourself in a storm. You got to make sure, first of all, that you are anchored in Christ. You got to make sure that what you're doing, you're doing it because of a conviction deep down within that God has equipped you 
and assign this particular task or this particular ministry or this particular situation to your name. Your own assignment. It might help you somebody. But you need to understand also that you need help when you're in the storm. You can't handle the storm by yourself. And the Bible says that in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came walking on the wall. Now you got to understand, in Jewish time, the night was divided into four watches, first, second, third, and fourth watch. He could have come in the first watch of the night. He could have come in the second watch or the third watch. But he waited until the fourth watch, believing to believe thinking that he waited to the fourth watch because he had them to do all that they could to see a Galilee as his body is pointed it's about six miles. And the Bible said it was in the midst of the sea, which means that the sea of Galilee, the wide point is six miles. It means that they had been warned for nine hours and had only accomplished three hours. But he had to wait until they had exhausted all of their props. He had to wait until they had finally come to realize, you know what? We just can't handle it. And as long as you think you can handle life by yourself, on your own, with your love, according to the school you went to, if you think that's all you need to handle life, you're in for a disappointment. Because sooner or later, Life's going to present you with something that the subject matter did not cover in your English class, in your biology class, in your chemistry class. Life got a way of throwing stuff at us that is not uh, included in the uh, institutional curriculum. That, that the life, life will throw some stuff at you that you need power and help from beyond the human life. That's where God comes from. And Christ said, now they, they got it now. They can't have that. And so he kept walking on, on the water, on the full watch of the night. Now watch. He kept walking on the water. What was giving him trouble? Wind and breeze, waves were giving him trouble. And Christ kept walking on top of that, which was causing him trouble. He's always above the trouble. Whatever is causing you trouble, he's above that. Whatever is causing you heartache is above that. Whatever is causing you unrest in your life is above that. Whatever is causing you worry is above that. Yeah. 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 So then, it doesn't matter when you come. What matters is that he come. He, he came. He came. He grew up. And whenever he come, he come to bless you. Whenever he come, he come. To help you whenever you come, you come to put your soul at ease. It may not look like it. I call upon you to ease my burden. Seems like you're putting more burden on me. It just might seem that way. But know this, whenever he comes, he comes to take charge and to take control and to bring you to that destiny that God has for you. He came. And not only did he come walking in the water, you saw the scripture that said that they were uh, afraid because they thought he was the spirit. But he wouldn't let them remain in that particular mindset, that conception, because he wanted them to give him the credit for what he was about to do. And a lot of times we give our job the credit. We give this the credit and that the credit. But God wants us to give him credit. He wants us to give him credit for our being here today. He wants us to give, us, give him credit for our having eyesight and our being able to articulate speech. He wants us to give him credit for bringing us safety from yesterday to this day. He wants us to give, us to give him credit for the job that we have, the money that we make, the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the house. That we live in the car, that we run. God wants you to give Him credit for the talent that you have, the ability that you have. He wants you to give Him credit for the time that you spent with your loved ones and your friends. He wants you to give Him credit 
for blessing your children if they finish school and went further. Whatever it is, God wants you to give them the credit. I disciplined them. I told them this. I made sure they wouldn't do this. And I bought them this. And that's okay. But God said in the final analysis, whatever you did, you were able to do it because I blessed you and put you in that position. You wouldn't have any money to give them had I not given you a job. You wouldn't have no lesson to teach them had I not given you a mind and an understanding and put you on the instructor to give you give your mother and a father to teach you the way of love. That's why you were able to communicate to the other. They might help in some Yeah, so he came here. And yes, he came and he identified himself to his disciples. He said, be not afraid, ego I mean, it is I. Yeah, it, 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 it is I. And, and Peter, he didn't read that, that, that section, but it's just today. Peter says, well, since it is you, please enable me to do the same thing you are doing. You walking on, y'all miss that? Okay, I'll make it clear to you. Peter said, I see what you do. You're walking on the water. Now please permit me to do the same thing that you do. Please permit me to do. You get the, you get the point I'm trying to make? I'm trying to make this at this point. If you want to do what Jesus is doing and you ask him, he'll give you the grace to do what he did. <laughs> Jesus granted people this request. And so then, if you want to obey the Father like Jesus obeyed the Father, just ask him. He gives you grace to obey him. And, and, and if you want to love unconditionally, if you want to get beyond the tit for tat thing, and then ask him, give me that love. Enable me to love like you love. You love the good, you do love the bad. You, you love those who supported you, you love those who didn't support you. You love those who, who talk good about you, you love those who talk bad about you. If you want to love everybody, you carry out the Great Commission, all you got to do is ask them. Peter, you want to walk a long time? You want to love like I love? Come on. You want to forgive like I forgive? Come on. I'm doing. Yes, and so now when you give Peter the permission, Peter got out of the boat. And Peter began to walk on the water. But something happened. Peter allowed himself to become sidetracked. He lost his focus. He lost his initial faith. His initial faith began to go I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. Maybe that was a time when you lived at a high level of faith in God. Maybe that was a time when you just woke up and just leaned in the business. I don't know what's going to happen to me through, uh, throughout this day, but Father, I'm asking you to guide me and direct me. And whatever comes my way, give me the grace to represent you in an honorable way. Maybe you live like somebody with a lesson. Maybe you live at a high level of faith at some time. Maybe it didn't matter to you what folks thought about you, what they said about you. Your aim and only aim in life was to please God and to satisfy Him. That was the time when you cast not some, but all of your care. You knew that God would provide. You took Paul seriously when he said, My God shall supply all of your needs. You believe that. You believe what Jesus said when he said, If you're not, the door is going to be open. If your eyes are going to give you, if you seek, you're going to find. You won't believe that. You believe that all things are going. You didn't complain. You didn't find God. But you pray to God in all circumstances of your life because you believe that all things were working together.
yeah, the, the good, the gold you love. Yeah. You believe that you were more than a conqueror, and it didn't matter what life threw at you because you knew that God had given you the victory. Yeah. And you decided, I'm not going to pop, but I'm going to shout. Come on, man, whatever comes my way, I'm going to shout, I'm going to pray my way through because I know that this will not last all the time. All the time you live in the high level of faith. But maybe at this time, like Peter, your faith began to move. Somewhere along the way, you began to doubt. You began to look around and you're seeing that there. God was remembering and had remembered everybody yeah. but you. Your faith began to wane. It is here at this point that you need to imitate Peter. Yeah. When Peter's faith began to wane, yeah. when Peter began to say, uh -huh. it was at this point that Peter offered a prayer. Yeah. It wasn't a long prayer that like somebody else. <laughs> but it was a short prayer. Lord, save me. You need to do that. You need to remember that. Your faith has begun to wane again. You need to remember what Peter did. Cry out to God. Lord, save me. Now, Peter could say, Lord, save me. And the Bible says that Jesus stretched forth his hand. And he took Peter by the hand, which means that Jesus was near Peter. You need to know that he is near me. He is near me. That's the point I'm trying to make. He was, near, he was able to stretch forth his hand and take Peter's hand. He is near me. He just arm that away from me. You call upon him. I don't care what stone has come into your life, and I don't care how you may be sinking in that stone. If you cry out to him, he is near you. He will come and rescue you. Jesus is still here. You may not, at this point, feel his presence, but he is near. The Bible said he is near those of a broken heart. And when you're caught in a storm, you don't have to be overtaken by that storm. You need to recognize that Jesus is near. But I want to share with you several assurances that you can't have when I close this message. Uh, when you're in the storm, first of all, you need to say to yourself, he brought me here. Yeah. The disciples were in the storm because Jesus told them to go to the other side. And, and you have to remember that what is taking place in your life and where you are is not by accident, not by incident. God has ordered the circumstances of your life. And so then, he brought you there. And listen, the disciples were in God's will because they obeyed what he said. Go to the other side, so I'm going to the other side. And if you're in the storm because you obey God, then you can rest with great assurance that God is here with you. And let me say this to you, it's better to be, you got to get this, it's better to be in the storm with Jesus than to be on the land with the cross. You may feel that it's safer on the land with the cross, but it's safer in the storm with Jesus. There are two kinds of storms, you want to remember that. Two kinds of storms. First of all, there are correction storms. Where God disciplines us for our disobedience. So God may allow a storm to be in your life because he, His aim is to discipline you, to correct you for some dis disobedience. That happened to John. John got caught in the storm. Now the disciples were caught in the storm because they obeyed Christ. John was caught in the storm because he disobeyed God. But he might set a correction storm. But then, secondly, he may allow what we call a perfection storm, where God helps us to grow because of our obedience. You see, if you are obedient to God, 
far from guaranteeing that everything gonna go easy. It just might go hard. Because he wants to perfect you, he wants to promote you. When you pass the test that is given you in fifth grade, yeah. they move you on to sixth grade. <laughs> and so then when you pass the minor test, yeah. Yeah. God will allow another test, a major test, yeah. because he wants to promote you yeah. from one degree of living to another. Somebody ought to shout at this, please. Yeah. If you're not giving a test, you remain in the same grade. Yeah. And God is saying, you're a master this, you have confidence this, you have learned a lesson that this stone here wanted you to learn. Now I'm going to increase the stone because I want to increase your development. I want to increase your learning. I want to increase your knowledge. I want to increase your strength. And so then, stones are, that's why you say sometimes, you know what, man? It seems to me, when I was out there in the world, when I was playing church, looked like everything was going good. But when I decided that I was going to give my life to Christ, and I was going to be obedient, and I was not going to play church anymore, but I was going to be serious about it, looked like all hell broke out. Suddenly all hell broke out, because God said, you are a master dead. I want to promote you to something big. And something good. Yes, yeah, I'm helping somebody in this place. Now I want you to listen to a couple of lessons, other lessons I want you to see. Now notice, Jesus had tested them in the storm before. If you read Matthew 8, 23 through 27, you find that what Jesus was in the boat, in the hinder part of the ship, sleeping, and a storm came up. Now he had tested them. <coughs> tested them. He had tested them before in the storm. But at that time, the first test that they had, Jesus was in the boat with them. Somebody get it. He was in the boat with them, so I'm going to give them a stone test. But I'm going to be in the boat with them. And so then all they had to do was go and wake them up. We're in the stone. And Jesus stands up and says, Peace be still. But not so they learned that. But I want you to notice the progression here. Yeah. When he found the stone in that first ship, the first stone, when he saw that stone, and they woke him up, and he come to see, what did the disciples say? The response of what matter of a man is this, who even the wind and the waves move Now that is, got to get it. Listen, in that first, first stone in that Jesus was, was in the ship. And he come, the storm, the impact that it had was that it led them to say what manner of a M-A-N man is this who even the wind and the waves will be. But now he would give them a second storm. And this time he would not be in the ship. He is outside of the ship. Oh, it's easy to trust him when you see him. It's easy to trust him when things are wrong. But now I'm going to intensify this. I'm going to give him another stone. But this stone here, I'm not going to be in this ship. I'm going to be on the outside of this ship. I'm going to be on the mountain praying where they can't see me. I'm going to try and increase that faith. Now in the first stone, when they, we woke, they woke him up. They say, what matter of a M A N man is this? But when he got in the ship and come the second son, do you know what they said? Thou art the son of God. You see the progression? You see the growth? What manner they move from what manner of man is this? To now we'll convert. Thou art the son of God. And every storm is going to increase. Your knowledge of God, it ought to increase your trust and your confidence in God. Every stone is designed to bring you to a point where you know and learn more about after the stone than you did before the stone. And so in a, in a stone, you're resting knowing that Jesus also is praying for you. Romans 8 and 34 says, Who is he that forgiveness? It is Christ that died. Dear brother, that is risen again. Who is 
even at the right hand of God who make intercession for us. That scripture is saying when you are in the storm, you need to remember that Jesus is praying for you. He is praying for you. You're not there by yourself. You're not going through it. And, and, and the outcome of what happened is not determined and dependent upon your strength, your ability. Jesus is praying for you. Can you imagine that? He died for you. He was buried for you. He rose for you. He ascended to heaven for you. He's on the right hand of the Father. He's praying for you. How can you lose? With God above you, the Spirit within you, and Christ on the side of you. Every season on your behalf. Yes, Father, they miss the mark sometimes, but I died for them. Yes, Father, they don't always get it right, but I'm there as their representative. I'm there as their advocate. He's praying for you, know that. And whatever you're in right now, Jesus is praying for you. He's on your side. Another thing you need to say to yourself, he will come to God. Often we feel that Jesus has deserted us when we are going through the hard times of life. When you find yourself weakening and down because of the storms in your life. Remember, Isaiah said, when thou passest through the water, I will be with you. And through the river, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Peter is to be commended. I know we have it. Peter got up and put it down. He began to say, Peter faith began to fail. But first of all, before we condemn Peter, we ought to commend him. At least he got out of the boat. Anybody can sit in the boat and watch. Anybody can sit in the boat and criticize. Anybody can sit in the boat and point fingers. Everybody can sit in the boat and let others do the work. But I think Peter got out of the boat. His faith failed, yeah, but he got out of the boat. He became a friend, yeah, he got out of the boat. He didn't make it all the way through, but he got out of the boat. He had courage to get out of the boat. You all have courage. Get out of the boat of despair. Get out of the boat of hatred. Get out of the boat of unconcern. Get out of the boat of complacency. Get out of the boat. You might begin to say, but always remember Jesus is right there. But all you have to do is call on him. He'll reach out his hand and pick you up. He won't let you drown. He won't let you fear. At least you have the courage to get out of the boat. To get out of the boat. To leave your comfort zone. The last thing I want to mention to you is that Peter got out of the boat. The other disciples stayed in the boat. But because Peter got out of the boat, the other disciples were able to see Paul and Jesus. They were comfortable sitting in the boat. But I ain't in that thing. I'm not going to do that. I might just see you. Just, uh, John probably said, but I will see what happened to that man. Oh, you won't get out of the boat. Look, they said. <laughs> but, but Peter getting out of the boat, putting himself in that sinking position, allowed the other disciples who were afraid to get out of the boat to see the power of Jesus. <laughs> you might be beaten upon, and it might be whipped, life might be whipping upon you, and friends and so forth might be giving you a hard time. But remember this, remember this, the bruises, you can scum that you did or help somebody else. Yeah. When Paul was in prison, the Philippians let us, he said, brothers who were afraid to preach the gospel, when they looked at me and saw that I was being punished and placed in prison for preaching the gospel, he said, they waxed strong. And they began to preach with boldness. And if that young man who got killed on week before last. And if many of your sisters and brothers are dying on a mission field, right
right now, the Lord will give you courage to serve God in peace for time and in a peace for conscience. You ought to get up off it and serve God. There are those who are giving their life and they're not in that condition of business. They're not sitting on plush coffee. I'm walking on flood coffin and sitting on comfortable pew. They are in the jungle. They are hiding. That's a sneak in and, and me. And if they can go through trials and tribulation and hardship for the gospel of Christ, yeah. what make you and what make you can pay the little price that God has come to you? You see, if you obey God, not only will he bless you, but he will make you a blessing. That's my message to you. I may be one today in your presence. God is calling. God is calling for those who are with it. You get out of the boat. You're willing to get out of the boat. You're able to give your grace. See, we have limited 